Welcome to the second panel of this uh, a marathon. Uh, I could not resist my, my personal affiliation to a certain retro uh, futurist ap approach and uh, to show you the first multimedia uh, school book for kids, actually. It's uh, called uh, Orbis Sensualum Pictus, Visible World in Pictures, by a uh, phenomenal uh, thinker of might be Slovak origin, Jan Amos Komenius, who was later called the teacher of nations. Uh, so Orbis Sensualium Pictus is visible world uh, in pictures. These are the, the, the general data on this thing. Uh, so it's about translation, it's about education, and it's encyclopedia. Encyclopedia means children in circle. And these are the few pictures from the first uh, English issue. So you see that it's picture and a word. Latin is the base and always translated. So far in the next uh, two centuries, this publication was, was translated to 14 languages and distributed widely all around the world. Comenius belonged to strong cosmologists of, of his era with Francis Bacon and others, but he had a very, very specific approach. His approach was not esoteric, but his approach was exoteric. So his, this was an approach in distribution of the knowledge in understandable forms. Air, fire, water, an invitation. This is uh, the uh, Orbis Pictus revised installation uh, at uh, Exhibition Multimediale Karlsruhe ZKM in, in mid-60s, which was uh, a work of, of uh, Czech media uh, expert uh, Milos Wojciechowski. And this is, uh, this is its uh, uh, kind of complexity, because what Comenius uh, recommended was to uh, combine usage of this tiny book with toys. So we have relation of subjects, we have relations of objects, and this is what we call the birth of, of uh, multimedia. But uh, before I will introduce and give word to our panelists, I would go, like to go even back to the history, because we will speak very much about knowledge production and knowledge distribution and whatever educational processes or distrib distribution of knowledge can be in such a complicated era, which we can characterize by uh, extreme interpretational participation and morbid uh, infobesity production. So knowledge production to produce knowledge is, is okay, but how we distribute and how we reach the, the respondent, that's, that's a question. So this is the quote from one of the most uh, significant parts of, of so-called Old Testament, uh, which has also it, its parallels in, in philosophies of Far East. But what is interesting is Kohelet uh, means gatherer, but traditionally it's translated as teacher or preacher. So there is a strict relation between gatherer, teacher, and preacher. Of course, like teacher is also and the community also. Uh, so what is embedded in this meaning or possibilities of this meaning is of course also hegemony and, and tyranny and etc. 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 So now I will give word to uh, Václav who will uh, uh, provide us with the message from Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed unfortunately uh, uh, could not be with us but uh, he has sent his uh, proclamation. He's sending his regards. Sorry. Mohammed's really sad uh, not being able to be here, and he sent me this uh, length uh, message, so I'm sorry for just reading it plain out loud. We have been, and he's speaking on behalf of uh, the new center, 
Uh, we have been politically interested in being part of the movement that has been opening up to the spectrum of leftist thought from its uh, self-imposed rigidity, resulting from overcommitment to the past and present at the expense of the future. We particularly have been interested to go beyond Frankfurt School and the post-structuralist limits placed on the humanities and arts in order to reimagine egalitarian emancipation in the age of post-humanism and artificial intelligence. This, of course, involves taking our dreams and nightmares on the horizon seriously and engaging with them fearlessly. New Center was built upon the idea of uh, that distance, both physical and theoretical, should not limit a pedagogical process and influential uh, and significant minds and rigorous scholarship. New Center thinks distance, both physical and theoretical distances, are healthy. Sorry. Away uh, from the charismatic power of the professor and closer to the co collective spirit of intelligence in general, New Center has embraced uh, these distances instead of considering it a shortcoming. And uh, it has used them to develop collective and shared thinking. These distances has allowed uh, our researchers and students to be far more critical of our professors in the seminar setting. No professor has ever gotten idealized at the New Center and most will, uh, most will meet intelligent challenges by students in their seminar. I don't know if I shall continue because it's a really long list of uh, thoughts that Mohammed sends and maybe, maybe Julieta can say something about the actual practice of New Center. Julieta is, is a member of the board of, of uh, uh, New Center and uh, uh, Julieta is a person of, of many layers and, and, and many occupations, uh, which will be, uh, yes, uh, released later on. Uh, well, I am not speaking right now as myself, uh, but <laughs> as, uh, as uh, uh, an envoy of uh, Mo Salemi. Um, and I, I think one of the uh, interesting things things about the new center when I became a member of the board is uh, precisely this, like its understanding of um, the, the digital sphere not as a handicap in the pedagogical process, but to try to understand that it's built not, you know, that's a community that is not built upon being uh, uh, proximity uh, and being contiguous to each other, but in terms of affinities and how, just how does this space get constructed? And I will, uh, expand a lot more on that in a little bit, but I think that one of the interesting things um, as part of the pedagogical process is to participate in the construction of this space. Um, I don't want to necessarily place it within a chronological timeline of saying that's the future because I also think that's very much the present and to, con to continuously refuse what happens in, um, in what is not so-called real life it's uh, denying the evident and, and refusing to see how we have changed and like the tools that we have at our disposal. It's not that you know, one set of tools uh, replaces another, it's simply that our toolbox gets bigger. So, and in that sense, actually teaching at the new center and engaging um, at that level um, uh, by far surpasses the uh, <clears throat> contentiousness that has uh, at points been associated with it. Um, so that's... Uh, uh, I would like to ask if there is any, for any critical note of Hillary. Hillary will play the role of a critical note in, in this panel. Uh, it's, it's uncritical, it's just an observation that um, a spatial, the way you're speaking about space so far, every, when we've had children in a circle, which to me is like phenomenology without ideology, you know, that you gather these pure minds to examine some phenomenon. And then you're talking about distance, or Muhammad is talking about distance. I thought you meant Muhammad. I thought you were making a joke. Muhammad can't be here. <laughs> Moh but it's Muhammad. Muhammad. <laughs> oh, Muhammad. I'm sorry. It slipped my ear. Um, so that this, the unidealized teachers and the, the, the space and the construction of a pedagogical space where you can examine this and, and whether that is, which one, I mean, to me, phenomenology without, you know, children in a circle is a lovelier thing than hypercritical children. 
uh, I mean hypercritical students rather. So I was just um, anyway. That was my. I like hypercritical children actually. Hypercritical it's, children. It's fantastic. Yes. So now I will ask uh, Julieta to bring the first key. Uh, okay. So I need to yes, you have to. I think. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So um, this is not the logical. Um, there I am. Um, <laughs> I guess. Uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I. I. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, I, I start by um, uh, introducing myself as an artist because that's the easiest uh, way to more or less explain. Ah, yes, I'm sorry. Full screen. Um, um, so, I mean, like, I think presenting myself as an artist is much easier to be able to trace a timeline of the things that I do. Um, uh, I think at the core of my work has always been um, the idea of uh, time and how do we uh, relate to it, um, like how does it enter a practice, not so much again in the chronological uh, linearity but in the sense of multiple temporalities and how do we inhabit multiple temporalities. Um, just to run you a little bit very, very quickly through the things that I do, maybe one of the most interesting things uh, for me in terms of inhabiting multiple temporalities was the, is the, the story of a little known archipelago in the South Pacific that's called Kiribati or Kiribati, if, uh, if you pronounce it correctly, that um, made a change on something that's called the international date line, um, uh, which is the, the imaginary line that separates uh, one day from another and that because of the way in which we measure the world actually allows us to um, run through, to, I mean, like to uh, encounter a time paradox um, in the flesh. So anyway, this has been, you know, like something that I have been trying to um, open up and, uh, you know, expand and understand, and, you know, uh, originally through sculptors and trying to make uh, things out of it. Then when a sculptor became insufficient, I ended up in Kiribati, um, trying to also understand what is the history of a place that um, is uh, almost invisible and yet incredibly visible on the imaginary and like the kind of power that it has, not just because of Kiribati, but because of the power that one can have uh, over time and over the imaginary in terms of uh, understanding our, our place in the world, let's say. Um, these are just like some quick images of uh, my trip there and what I encountered. Maybe I'll tell you about that at some other point because it has to do with the Second World War and things that are um, uh, unrelated to the digital sphere. But it has a lot to do with how we think about history. The, I mean, like, okay, just to, to open it up, this is like a part of the Second World War happening in space. Um, even if it was, even though it was contiguous space for the inhabitants of, of uh, Kiribati, they had no, you know, this was not their history. So um, it made me, like, you know, um, think a lot about how we uh, understand time and space, how to delaminate it, and the digital then um, opens this up, uh, this possibility a lot more. Um, kept working on this, kept working on time. Eventually, I brought this idea of time to the organization that I co-direct, which is EFLUX. Uh, we made a project where we um, tried to uh, turn time, uh, like you know, to put, uh, uh, to use time as an economic uh, system and time as a currency. Um, the project has been uh, moving around uh, many places. Um, it's a uh, you know, it's, it's uh, we have been a kind of like uh, using exhibition opportunities that we are uh, offered as artists to keep propelling this uh, project. Um, this is when it was presented in uh, the last edition of Documenta as a kind of a set of findings, let's say. Um, you tell me when you want me to stop because I can just keep going. Huh? <laughs> then um, the when it came uh, to thinking um, about like the relationship of time and space, which uh, also uh, happened a lot uh, when looking at an, how economical exchanges are constructed, especially ec economical exchanges that, exchanges that are based in trust, be it in the classroom or in society at large. Of course, a lot of um, a lot of these things are based on proximity and being ne next to each other. And how how do we build a world where we can create these kinds of relationships, um, forsaking uh, the necessity of uh, absolute proximity? 
Um, anyway, this is just uh, uh, more, uh, you know, things related to Time Bank, just little things about uh, efflux and the theory journal that we run, uh, where we ask also a lot of these questions. And then if I jump into the digital thing right now, um, then um, I read to you a little bit because it's easier. As the digital sphere becomes incorporated, a virtual geography starts to become apparent. In order to better grasp its constitution, we must accept that it, it does not intend to function as a one-to-one -one representation of real space or to become a virtual equivalent to reality because it is not defined by contiguous space, nor is it defined by the standard markers of the nation state, race, religion, language, and colonization. Rather, it is structured around notions of profit, and it doesn't limit itself to the physical sphere. It actually cuts into both personal space and time. Extracting information, monitoring your geolocation in the process of defying itself and its own boundaries. Curtailing the potentiality of the medium, a not quite obsolete authority enters into operation. Instead of a seamless World Wide Web, we are faced with the creation of, artif of artificial borders, which is like the corporate sandboxing of this, what can be um, a fully open digital sphere. And now, um, how do digital borders manifest? For example, in the sandboxing of devices made by Apple, which prohibits the use of third-party apps and penalizes the jailbreaking of iPhones. Or in China's internet policy, which determines the bounds of Google. These invisible borders were also apparent in January uh, of 2014, when cell phone users in Ukraine, who happened to be near the, near the scene of the Maidan clashes, received text messages saying, Dear subscriber, you are registered as a participant uh, in a mass riot. Willingly or not, these users were about to cross the border, the digital border between the good and the bad Kiev. Um, <clears throat> Though so social media was hailed as the enabler of uh, Arab Spring, the millions who took to the streets achieved no political gains. And in the wake of Snowden's revelations, an even darker picture of a corporate surveillance-driven internet began to emerge. Displacing and complicating the image of the internet as a space of limitless possibilities, the World Wide Web, like the Lacanian mother, was split in two. There is a good internet, based on communication and community. And there is now, too, the bad internet, a tool of corporate surveillance, trolling, and political punishment. And fake news, yes. Um, if we understand digital space as a territory in its own right, we need to scrutinize how said territory is being mapped. This is actually an image uh, that pertains to this. At some point, uh, the Denmark government decided to make a one-to-one -one, uh, representation of Denmark in Minecraft. And what happens soon after is that it became vandalized by, uh, Amer by Americans, as you can see. Um, now, um, this, the mapping of this territory is not happening with uh, Borgesian fidelity, as the interests that are trying to describe this territory are not concerned with accuracy or diversity, nor are they interested <coughs> in the imaginary. In old maps, uh, if you have seen, like uh, in the ma uh, images that Boris was showing, uh, unknown lands were often inhabited by fantastical beings, sea serpents, monstrous beasts, mermaids. Whereas in the most widely circulated maps of the digital world, the digital topographers labor to create a homogeneous landscape where a user is a user is a user regardless of where uh, she is, uh, disregarding the social and cultural accidents in the landscape and filling the unknowns in the map with replicas of the topographers themselves. The digital frontier carried the promise of a post-political condition, free of agonism and struggle, and of an economy of abundance instead of an economy of scarcity. But so far, this dream has been a weak utopia. Unable as of yet to shake off the 20th century, the frictionless space of perfect technological reception is just a first world effect. The conditions in which innovation is produced have nothing to do with the conditions in which innovation is deployed. To put it in William Gibson's words, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. Um, the production of digital affective device, devices, which double as control mechanisms, is dependent on the decimation of every digitally underrepresented region in the world. As this new geography displaces the old, the digital subject becomes more visible than the physical subject. 
While the circulation of celebrities, luxury goods, liberal professionals, tourists, and financial flows occupies the whole field of visibility, refugees, seasonal workers, immigrants, and illegal aliens are rendered invisible. Now the question is, what does the future look like for those that are lacking digital representation? And what does it look like for those who are overrepresented, the digitally obese? If the conditions under which I exist are too precarious for me to be considered a user in this new landscape, I may be destined for extinction, or I may already be extinct, part of a barren, obsolete present that will soon be discontinued. But it may be that the constitution of this subject is not yet fully graspable, and that in the rush to create the conditions for its viability, we have neglected, as of yet, to generate the tools to understand the, auto the atomized psychological space that she inhabits. If subjectivity was a function of private property, what happens when all the frameworks of ownership are incorporated? Even though the digital obeys physical laws that located within the material world, digital bodies are not fully recognized. And there is an ever-widening gap between how the treatment of a subject is prescribed and how the subject is constructed. Take, for example, the person who is institutionalized and has to surrender, in a mental institution, I mean, and has to surrender her digital devices so that she will be forced to only interact with her real friends even though her relationships are, at this moment, completely dependent on her being able to reach them through the very same devices that are being taken away. This atomized space, which has opened up because of our reliance on technology, is not necessarily bad. Um, it, and it imbues devices with an effective quality akin to that of transitional objects, to a subject whose heteroaffective other is not necessarily human. The selfie is no longer analogous to a self-portrait, but it functions rather as some kind of degraded mirror stage for, his, for this child of technology that sees the internet as her mother. And then um, I stop a little bit here. There's more. But now we move to Fasna, who is a philosopher, critic, curator, a multiple teacher at three Prague-based academies. And uh, we will hear a bit mm -hmm. on subject and object. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not an artist, obviously, so I'm a bit uncomfortable talking about myself because I, usually I'm supposed to talk about some important things, not myself. But anyway, I'll try to just wrap it up in some uh, theoretical discourse so that it, uh, it's, it's definitely not going to be so entertaining as... Uh, the last evening, but maybe we'll get uh, to the target as well. Anyway, uh, as has been said already, oh, uh, I, I do teach on three art uh, academies in Prague, and uh, the first one is the Academy of uh, Fine Arts. Here, here we have that, uh, founded in 1799, which was a particular moment in at, at least Czech history. It's basically the start of the uh, Czech National Enlightenment, uh, the stage where uh, people were trying to revive a sense of how, w w sense of being Czech or Czechoslovak later on. And uh, the academy was part of that. It was the part of the vision of uh, rebuilding the com community based on some kind of art practice, based on so some kind of art um, fabrication. Anyway, uh, the academy, as is the case of many institutions, completely lives up to this past or is kind of, uh, is in a way interlocked in this, in this uh, very conservative position. And uh, I have been actually trying to somehow, um, you know, subversively invert this and uh, focus on the future w with my teachings and with my dealings in the academy. And for instance, we, uh, we realized uh, last, um, last year's uh, diploma show in the National Gallery. I've been lucky to cooperate with the National Gallery of, uh, in Prague. And uh, we realized that under the title of New Wave, trying to reimagine, uh, provoke, reinvent the institutional background of, of let's say, the academy. Um, second uh, nice building from Prague is actually the Academy of uh, Applied Arts or Architecture, Design and Arts. 
and uh, there I teach uh, philosoph ancient philosophy, contemporary philosophy, and uh, the international student studio. But anyway, uh, that brings me to another problem. A again, 1885 is a particular year for Czech um, national enlightenment or Czech national uh, community. Uh, and, but uh, it brings me to another problem, and that's the market. Because when we are talking about institutions, and part particularly the academic institutions, they usually end up in this vicious circle of positioning themselves into some kind of, uh, you know, uh, into some kind of um, weak spot against the oppressive powers of the capital or of the neoliberal order, and then they stick to, let's say, the outdated or the past ideals of, of the, what, the, what did it meant to be uh, in a university, what did it meant to preserve the knowledge and things like that. And that's uh, maybe a case of, of this uh, academy which drives its course uh, mainly from the design departments. Um, I'll talk to how to maybe counter this kind of institutional uh, stance uh, later on. And the first one is actually the film and TV school of the Academy of Performing Arts in Prague. And again, uh, founded in 1946, I think it was like the fourth or fifth uh, film school in the world. So again, a particular moment within the institutional uh, history. And uh, uh, I, I uh, again like talking about uh, very briefly talking about this art school. I would just like to stress out my uh, personal experience uh, with switching all these free schools because uh, for me it's not really. Uh, I, I don't want to be so deeply associated with one of the institutions. I far more I enjoyed like being you know. Uh, in the, the, the be interconnecting all, the, all, all of them. So coming from the Academy of Fine Arts, I'm always visiting uh, the Film Academy and uh, the Design Academy. And by that, uh, or I, I would uh, try to wrap that uh, kind of approach into the concept of intersectionality. And I'll guess I'll talk about that a bit uh, later on. Anyway, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll talk in the yes. second section. So now I, I will ask uh, uh, Hillary for his kind notes to, to these two contributions. This is harder now. Um, I, um, I was noting that you were Julieta were speaking also a lot about small spaces, you know, the spaces between humans and this image of these entrapped people, and then the online, uh, you know, the Denmark coming and, and claiming a piece of this online territory, and then it's immediately a trap, just, and, the, and, the, um, and this, are we meant to ask questions? Am I meant to ask questions, or just yes. spiel? Oh, yes, sorry. yes. Um, I, um, so I suppose my first question is, what about b the bigger spaces? And then, and then what about the, um, you know, it just seems like there's just entrapment to be had, you know, that, that the, the, the desire for an online public space is literally just utilized as a trap for the likes of Facebook or what that was, you know, and that, that ideal of the, the, the cathedral where all humans have their avatars and, you know, these sort of, um, so something, uh, is that a zone of navigation? I mean, right now I think I am um, seeing two, possibi like two possibilities concurrent, yeah, and, and I want to believe that there are more, that there is, uh, I'm not a fan of uh, singular realities and a singular future and a singular temporality, so I think that it is of course possible that there is a uh, digital space that it's constructed upon capital and also a much freer digital space that exists simultaneously. And that's the one I'm interested in. And that's the one I'm actually addressing as an artist, as a teacher, as a thinker. The, oh. not, it's not in, in a fight with the other one, I, because the, to enter into a fight with capital is uh, it's, it's a worthy fight, it's not the fight I am engaged on. I'm yeah. leaving that to other people. Um, I'm fully supportive of them, but mm -hmm. it's not where I live. And, uh, 
Well, intersectionality, I was really going to leap on that with gusto, but um, you just left it at the end. Um, I guess um, I'm going to just defer and leave maybe more time later because that was, I'm, I'm, is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So now I would like to give the voice to uh, Frederike. Uh, Frederike is an uh, assistant curator at TBA and uh, uh, she will uh, con contextualize her significant contribution to the continuity of uh, our shared learning uh, uh, project, but in much wider sense. I want to talk about digital, the digital or digital environments, as I think we have extraordinary experts in this panel for this matter. But I want to um, invite you to meditate briefly on the act, uh, to meditate on the act of hacking, as suggested in the Hacker Manifesto. Quote, to hack is to express the possibility of new worlds beyond necessity, end of quote. Hacking breaks open uh, deadlocked structures and enclosed systems, manipulates techno-semiotic structures to make them do things they were never intended to do. Let's collectively um, hack education, that is, deconstruct decode and reconceive it in the realm of the institution as an agent of change. I'm aware that my following um, suggestions come very close to um, the ideas of new institutionalism, but I want to propose to read them rather through the lens of Charles Esch's um, experimental institutionalism um, that can be roughly summarized um, by the following three criteria. Um, the emancipation of the institution from free market capitalism, the prioritization um, of long-term occupation with ideas and exhibitional projects, um, since only through investing time and persistence can institutions um, distinguish themselves from conventional cultural spaces and their spectacle of the, in the exhibition. The third criterion of um, experimental institutionalism is, I think, and I think it's the most important in the context of this panel today, that institutions should engage in uh, innovative forms of interaction among artists, curators, and visitors, and initiate original modes of exchange. Core to this horizontal reforming um, is the re-evaluation of spectators as collaborators um, and active shapers um, of the institutional message. Think of, for instance, um, the Arte Museum, Arte Util Museum um, that Charles Escher had initiated with um, Tania Borghera in, at the Van Eber Museum in Eindhoven. Let's think education differently and with it the institution's relationship to its visitorship. Um, this, traditionally this relationship um, has been rather asymmetrical and uh, unilateral and governed by the regime of truth. Um, let's undo this disciplining of thought and uh, this hierarchizing of um, identities and reinvent the institution as a multi-directional learning system that, in line with experimental institutionalism, gives rise to new subjectivities and conditions of intersubjectivity. Um, in his book, Futurability, um, The Age of Impotence and the Horizon of um, Possibility, Franco Biffo Baradi maps the social landscape um, we live in today. Quote, the true actor of our time is digital abstraction, financial automatism, um, and the process of automation of cognitive active activity, end of quote. Social solidarity is vanishing, and empathy is being replaced by competition. Um, the rise of autochthonic politics, um, the increase in populist protectionism, and the widespread climate of fear and suspicion geared at individuals were forced into migration are perfect examples for this, I think. Um, instead of reproducing conventional power structures, the institution has the unique opportunity, and I think um, where I may claim um, the resources to provide platforms that generate new forms of solidarities and encourage multi-relational processes of the exchange of knowledges, ideas, values, and imaginaries. Um, and it is this very complexity of, or it is the very complexity of the world that almost forces us as institutions, as well as individuals, um, to abandon single perspectives and to allow for multiple 
and sometimes also uncomfortable um, vantage points. So why not reversing um, the conventional dynamics between institution and visitor and listen instead of speaking to her? Inviting a hybrid chorus of voices to actively shape our institutional message. Let's let loose of aggressive didacticism and interrupt the visitor's expectations and necessarily also disappoint her and ultimately give rise to generative misinterpretations and non-understanding. I'm currently creating the so-called shared learning program um, of the Greenlight Project at the Venice Biennial. Um, the program is conceived as a multi-directional and alternative educational platform um, and manifests um, uh, processes of unlearning through um, unconventional encounters um, between refugees and asylum seekers, artists, thinkers, students, and visitors. Um, the shared learning principle is anchored in critical pedagogy um, and encompasses activities that cater to the needs, desires, or official needs, the desires and specific backgrounds of the Greenlight participants, um, like Italian language courses, legal and psychological counseling, um, as well as job training, but also events um, uh, directed towards a more abstract and imaginary thinking, including artistic workshops, seminars, talks, discussions. Um, and I only wanted to quickly um, touch upon the, to me, exemplary um, approach of the Italian film collective Zalab, um, that entered a unique collaboration um, with the Greenlight participants um, for a participatory video laboratory. So over the period of two weeks, um, they invited the participants, were interested in participants to explore filming, sound recording, script writing, um, and to eventually make their own documentaries, which are now on view in the central pavilion of the Venice Biennial. So Zaleb would um, introduce, for instance, how to use a camera uh, in a way that they trained only one volunteering participant um, that in turn would explain it to the following, that one to the next one, and so on. So in this sense, Zaleb acted much more um, as a stimulator and friend um, rather than as a top-down teacher. And in the course of this workshop, participants reportedly felt empowered and encouraged to express themselves freely. So emanating from this curatorial and methodological experience, in addition to um, the impulses I have given earlier, um, I would like to advocate for an institution in the becoming and an ecology of rhizomatic education. To this end, following um, Alex Ferguson and his institutional mores, I would like to make a couple of suggestions which will hopefully explain what I mean by that. Um, to provide several different platforms, thereby generating multiple contact points um, um, to reach a multifaceted um, audience or visitorship, and thereby improving um, the impotencies of ne uh, new institutionalism. Or as Ferguson has put it, quote, work on different scales to create spaces for participa participation. It's through these more intense encounters, varying from, say, five to 55 people in the room, that audiences become participants, collaborators even, in the development of what constitutes the institution, end of quote. I further suggest to look at community centers, libraries, laboratories, churches even, um, to eat up, to immerse oneself in the local social tissue and to build a sustainable network of organizational partners, ultimately aiming for institutional solidarity to be generous with the visitor, to upload um, talks, seminars, and conferences along with the um, writing one commissions, to, be, to abandon the regime of truth, and to uphold the collective posing of questions as a radical educational force, to aim for shared authorship, to turn the visitor away from being passive recipient um, into being a, a collaborator, to actively defy the commodification of knowledge-based production and link the institutional practice to the formation of critical and to, have, um, to the formation of a critical and pluralistic public sphere. So what I mean by the institution in the becoming is being and persist in being truly open 
for adaptive and flexible and collaborative with the so-called outside world and its plethora of social, political and environmental um, concerns and with its very actors. To continue to ask oneself what the institution in the 21st century can actually facilitate, what its responsibility is, um, because I think the moment you know the answer to that very question, you are simply reproducing your own power. So let's aim for being pioneers in an ecology of rhizomatic education that is in a horizontal learning system grounded on inter institutional solidarity and reciprocity between institution and visitor. Thank you, Frederica. Hilary? Ooh. <laughs> I am so mild-mannered. That was fascinating. Um, I, I, I loved, you, I said several things I want to talk about. Um, the idea of visualizing the frontier. You say you want the, 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 the people are brought to a certain frontier. And I say that to actually give a form to a frontier, you know, the, it helped the Americans to conjure up manifest destiny when they looked over these vast plains and, and that uh, basically I'm coming is that there needs to be an institutional um, cooperation, maybe a full spherical strata rather than local cooperation, but rather all these mega institutions, which is what they really are, to actually um, colonize uh, some kind, kind of online architecture that goes beyond all these individual attempts to have an online presence and all these, but rather some the real solidarity that would really allow some traction in that zone is, is something like all of the institutions building that spherical strata where these kind of frontiers are literally held. Thus, if there are these questions in philosophy, aesthetics, etc., there they, they sit visually in a frontier because I think there is a romanticism of these people coming from these absolutely desperate situations and they basically want institution. I want institution. I come from a post state, I, you know, and that you happen to arrive as the institution that they first get traction on, you know, and so, and, and not, so as not to romanticize that grasp in that embrace um, of um, um, and and to think very carefully about where you, uh, where you can actually find you know where you're not actually replacing something like a state um, and um, but the main point is a vernacular a vernacular architecture all of you I'm feeling it's about it's, it's, it's ridiculously in the same way that the museums have undertaken all these huge building projects and they're you know, just expanding in the real world and there's something like an online building project for all these museums to undertake and, and somehow, anyway, to formalize that visually, vernacular, then you can expect an embrace to actually uh, be able to understand and to be, you can trust the embrace of some radically other thing coming into the bosom of this voluptuous institution. Yeah, um, um, and then, so anyway, that was nothing. This is not my usual line of work here. Um, so basically, I say ridiculously, this is one, one thing I want to just say one more time, ridiculously, the same way that these institutions have colonized the horizontal frontier with all these new buildings and expanded radically and more and more people coming through in this marvelous event, actually, you know, open to critique, but nonetheless, the result is resounding. I say online, it's a similar thing, but it really calls on these institutions to have the cooperation you're talking about, literally at the level of what are the principles of us building the online museum, the spherical strata that brings them all into one terrain where frontiers are palpable and visual, palpable to the guts of any human being so they can understand where on what you actually are. You know, you name yourself as these frontiers, a certain frontier you are colonizing. There's a certain destiny that you feel is manifest for aesthetics and institutional, you know, I mean, not aesthetic, don't, I didn't mean that, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, 
also rhizomatic. Come on, who needs more rhizomatic? We want fruiting bodies. We really do want spores, fruiting bodies. Let the mushroom come. Enough rhizome, endless horizontal web. You know, we really have enough of that shit. We want some verticality. We really do. And those ones that can poke up through the loam will be rewarded with the sporical propagation of their brand. Um, I mean, well, what is the rhizome? It's the, 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 the layers upon layers of strictly vertical interconnectivity. Uh, what was that word? Intersectionalities like mad. We want some unanimities where we all squirm together and produce fruiting bodies. We have the market. We need the cathedral. We really do. It's time online to have the cathedral. And so these traps that are set to capture us in our seeking, oh, Denmark, come Oh, there it is, the online community, you know, these most lovely creatures, right? They're totally not um, gross. And they go walking into these traps, just like we do on Facebook, and it creates all these sicknesses. So I say for these institutions, which are so much about these architectural spaces where to your very guts of any human, the universal human, refugee, desperate, uh, you know, totally relaxed, undesperate, nonetheless, they can all read this with their visceral, intrinsic sensitivity, aesthetic human sensitivity. So I say the task is in this ridiculous way a building project online where the, if you really want to reach out to such a vast, you don't just want the aesthetes and the fancy folk, you really want to welcome these raw creatures. And even if there is something of like, hey, you, uh, aesthete, behold a person who is rubbing hard against material reality, you know, that's, that's a tricky thing, right? It's, right? And, I say you got to create a vernacular space where they are at least understanding where what frontier they're at, and it's and and rather than um, yeah, because there's a very uh, it will reduce the quality of that interaction between aesthete and refugee. The refugee is maybe an aesthete, maybe a materialist, maybe a scientist, maybe an agriculturalist. Who knows? I mean, they, now they're just a refugee, right? <laughs> so if you really want to welcome such, um, such an open, you know, um, amorphous kind of um, category of human, right, who is, needs institution, right? I say you have to name yourself very well um, in, in the architecture. And rhizome is not the answer. <laughs> uh. Václav, now your turn. So, let's beat him with the inter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Enough of uh, buildings from Prague. And <clears throat> actually, I want to talk about this uh, simple scheme. In academia, from where I basically come today, we love schemes and we love diagrams. So. Uh, Please permit me at least one. <clears throat> so what, what we actually understand as an institution, and there has n not been any significant attempt to define uh, up until maybe t t today and now. Anyway, what, what we define as an institution is basically the relation between what we know and who actually knows, who preserves, who acquires the knowledge, who's being subjected to the knowledge. And uh, the, so, so there, there must be uh, this kind of interaction between what, what do we know and who actually uh, creates the knowledge, uh, who uh, consumes uh, the knowledge, to whom it's distributed. And I, I think we, uh, like in, in general, in, in the history of universities, we have uh, quite um, overvalued uh, uh, the, the contentual thing in the university or higher degree learning process. That means the epistemology. Uh, universities were really uh, based on the idea that we 
uh, in order to attain some kind of objectivity, in order to have this kind of you know d d uh, distance from, let's say, even the political issues, we just need to focus on what we know, what, what is actually the subject matter. And they have quite uh, neglected uh, the thing that actually knowledge cannot just stay you know, intact or cannot just stay in the museum, in the classroom, but the knowledge needs to have some kind of transformative value, some kind of metanoia. And therefore, that uh, universities are also tr triggering some kind of change or some kind of potentialities. So uh, I think uh, when we are talking about how to somehow adapt or how to uh, how to update the institution for the era of uh, digital and educational environments, uh, we really need to consider this kind of move. I, I know we basically, it, it's a cliche or banal thing, maybe you'll uh, criticize me for the lack of verticality, but anyway, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just repeating what, what we know. We need to inspire some kind of agency. We need to, um, we need to uh, switch the priorities and uh, not to focus focus on what the institutions preserve, but we need to focus on what the institution trigger or what, what the institution uh, incite in, uh, in terms of uh, both social change and theoretical, uh, our theoretical knowledge. Uh, one, one thing how to actually uh, address the, pro the problem of agency or the praxis, practice of the institution itself is to turn to what do we actually do at the university and that's basically writing. So we uh, may be, uh, maybe we just know, uh, we, we just need to have some kind of ethics of writing. Maybe writing is not just a thing we uh, do in order to, I don't know, uh, fulfill the grant conditions or if, uh, in order to, um, you know, uh, have another uh, nice book on uh, Kant or theory of art, but writing may be an ethical option, may be an ethical obligation, and uh, particularly in our current conditions, which are, uh, I would say, uh, marked by this kind of explosion of discourses. There's so many languages, there's so many codes, there's so many collaterals, and uh, we need to somehow may, make it vertical. We need to somehow make uh, 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 sense out of all those different uh, languages and codes and therefore we need uh, some ethics of writing uh, or poetics of knowledge that would uh, incite or inspire the sharing and belonging. So uh, if I move back to how to actually uh, transform, uh, how, how to do that, how to, uh, how to move from the Humboldtian classical research-based university to the so-called uh, um, uh, environments of education and digital, digital niches and spaces. I think we uh, definitely need to uh, escape the linear, centralized, self-centered uh, model of institutions, how they consider themselves to be you know, uh, so self-evident and important. And we, of course, need to uh, move into this I can even say rhizomatic, but in anyway, multi-perspective is interdependent, uh, like situation or condition. Maybe I can use the fancy word platforming because that's that's not only you know connected to the digital, but that's basically what uh, universities do. Uh, they are platforms or they are mediators between uh, between the knowledge that has been you know created generated over the course of our history and the presence so the uh, universities need to be the platforms for 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 knowledge uh, anyway another idea how to think about uh, this kind of transformation maybe uh, this kind of uh, spreading uh, or opening up of uh, the university institutions is, uh, or I borrowed the terms uh, of interstitiality and intersectionality, of course, from uh, the political philosophy. Uh, for instance, Homi Baba used uh, the interstitiality. And of course, in the concept, there's some kind of station. There's some kind of, uh, there's some kind of, uh, 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 strife or like a, 
uh, conflict in, in that work because uh, in, to be interstitial means to somehow uh, be aware of the other. And institutions among themselves, they can really cooperate on this kind of basis. But more um, deeper, I would, uh, I would consider the intersectionality. Uh, that means that we are not only like, you know, interacting together, but we overlap. Uh, we uh, reinvent what do we mean by ourselves, by our institutions, and by the audience. And uh, the, even like deeper, deeper uh, uh, metaphor lies in this uh, kind of intersexuality. So I would even opt for institutional uh, intersexuality, whatever, uh, whatever that means. Maybe I can, I can just briefly. Institutional intersexuality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let, let's. <laughs> it won't work for you. Anyway, uh, maybe I, 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 uh, it deserves some kind of uh, definition. Yeah, definition? Yeah, alternative. Yeah, <laughs> tell us about that. Okay. Uh, I would just stay with a very general thing. You can, you can build up more uh, metaphorical thing. Uh, institutional sexuality consists in the ability to agitate or be agitated by other institutions. So uh, it's all about uh, uh, agitation and uh, <laughs> institutional penetration and things like that. You can, you, you can imagine. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the new agit club. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, with, with sec sexuality and with sex, you know, that there is this, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, we, we, we have this like a very private uh, name of our collaboration with National Gallery Prague. Yeah. Because our acronym is TBA21 and, and they are NG, National Gallery, and, and altogether it's T-Bank. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually in Urban Dictionary, uh, in Urban Dictionary, it's, it's a particular pose. You know, <laughs> I mean, particular, you know, okay. position. Uh, so uh, I'm quite sure we will not use this, you know, yeah. this. Yes, but sexuality has, you know, it's a, a sex is a precarious thing. Huh? It yes. comes from secare, huh? it comes from to divide. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, what is, what is this relation between this, like, intercourse? Because sex as intercourse uh, was recorded only in, like, late 16th century as a meaning, you know? Mm -hmm. Sex as was just division, you know. So what, what is the relation, relation between these like division and intercourse like between institutions, yeah. like how, how this can, you know? But I think it's present uh, even in those more like serious theoretical terms. There's always something intersecting. That means it's not simply merging or it's not simply like uh, homogeneous, but it's actually uh, self-aware of the fact of the conflict or tension or that there's the other, you know. And I think that's what we in, in, in our institutional background need, to have institutions that can really overlap or uh, change their audiences, uh, change their maybe even staff and uh, somehow intersect or, or Penetrate. I, I don't know if that's really the answer, but anyway, uh, I have uh, I have examples so that it's not really so abstract. So uh, I, I just chose I don't know the, tonight uh, example of True and the School, which are two small uh, electronic music-based uh, clubs in Amsterdam. And uh, uh, what, what is peculiar in that case is that they are able to cooperate with large institutions like the New Museum or uh, Stedelijk or the Rijks Academy. And uh, it's because the, these institutions see a potential in acquiring a, a completely new audience, intersecting with uh, like other uh, publics. That's just a very easygoing example. And uh, intersexuality, I, I, I am showing this uh, image of actually Mohammed Salemi's uh, exhibition for Transit Display. But anyway, Transit Display is this very awkward uh, independent institution in Prague because it consists in transit, which is like uh, international 
organization uh, revolving around the art uh, research and uh, the whole um, uh, Central European uh, region. And Display, which has been uh, a gallery for contemporary art coming from abroad to Prague, and they somehow merged together into one space. And now, uh, w what is maybe more interesting or funny, now they are somehow uh, divorcing themselves. Now they are trying to get back, you know, get uh, disattached again. And it's, it's a very complicated process based on the money, space, and uh, program overlaps and things like that. But uh, apparently for me it's an example that the metaphor works, actually. Okay, but, but I, I'd like to end <laughs> very quickly and with something far more serious, I guess. Uh, the last uh, keynote will be from Julieta. And then we will give voice again to Hillary, and we will start to fight. Hmm? <laughs> but he, had to, he, was he wanted to finish something. Yeah, he was happy. Oh, no. He wasn't. He wasn't happy yeah. to leave it there. Okay, so, so we come back. <laughs> we come back to you, okay? okay. I'll, I'll think of something. Weren't you? Did you? Have yeah. Something? Okay. I say, let him come on. No. Okay. No? Yeah. Give him a few seconds more. Okay. My critical note. Okay, uh, uh, but there, there was just a very brief remark. Uh, 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 something far more sober, uh, a concept called realist institution. Uh, it, it actually comes from my conversation with uh, Armin Avenasian, but uh, a bit of uh, Victoria Ivanova as well. And they're uh, currently working on this concept uh, in order to, again, uh, find a language, how to actually uh, conceive of this uh, huge transformation of institutions in the age of digital environments. And uh, they're trying to s set this concept uh, so that we have an ideal, different ideal than the classical university. And the realist institution definitely does not uh, mean that we just stick to the business as usual or that we will be modest or will be like, you know, realists, uh, so-called. But it's actually the opposite. Uh, uh, realist institution is speculative. Uh, it needs to uh, constantly reinvent itself. Of course, it needs to be a rhizomatic, uh, at least to some extent. Of course, it still retains the verticality, but the real, it's realist because it uh, changes the real, or what do we consider to be real. It, uh, it is aware of its uh, function in terms of transforming the reality and transforming us as its audiences. Yeah, maybe that's it. For me at least, yes, it's meant to be like that. Um, for me at least, these are the most uncomfortable shoes because I've never intended to be an institution. This, um, to me and my partner in crime, who is Anton Bidokla, institution happened as a complete accident. Um, so, the, you know, like, it's like the moment where somebody would say, but isn't IFLOX an institution? And we look at each other and say, is it? Um, the, so, I mean, like for us, what has been very important in the construction of our project is um, the notion of circulation and the circulation of information. In that sense, we are going by the um, Bates on definition of what information is. Uh, to read the quote is, um, uh, in fact, what we mean by information, the elementary unit of information is a difference which makes a difference. And it's able to make a difference because the neural pathways along which it travels and because it's continually transformed and provided with energy. Um, now, this uh, sense of a difference that makes a difference and the continu continuous transformation is quite important for us. We um, consider ourselves to be shapeshifters. Um, we do not uh, want to repeat ourselves, we do not want to create monoliths, we do not want to create replicable models. Um, that uh, to us results in homogeneity, and homogeneity is the death of a system. So uh, for us it's important to create heterogene heterogeneity, like, the, like these kind of possibilities. Um, this is uh, something that cannot be scaled, like this idea of like, well, can this be scaled? No. Heterogeneity cannot be scaled, but it can be recombined. It can be, um, you know, you can foster things that can be assembled, that can be used as building blocks to, if needed, build something larger, and that something larger is dissolved when not needed any further. Um, we think a lot about that because, of course, our um, uh, 
what we don't consider to be an institution, but some people do. What we do is basically an uh, institution, uh, so-called, that's built on the backs of two people. And uh, I, we do not know if, um, you know, if uh, on our absence it would continue existing. It's something that we ponder sometimes. Is there a future to this thing that we do? Is there a future that's outside of us? And um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, like thinking about the future is of course something that is embedded in human nature. It's a byproduct of being aware of our own uh, mortality. And of course, when we look at, uh, towards the future at this particular point on the narrative of our planet, uh, we are facing the consequences of our development as a single doubt species. We are so special. And of placing ourselves at the center of the stage, as if we humans were the only actors that matter, everybody else is just extras, and as if everything else that surrounds us was only resources that can be deployed and exhausted in the name of history. And uh, I say this because I want to mention a project that I have been working on. This is the Ninth Futurological Congress, based on a Stanislav Lem uh, book. I can go uh, privately in detail later. Uh, if you want to know about it. Um, but um, this project, um, you know, like, um, comes about because uh, it is at this juncture that the options that we currently have in stock to think about the future become insufficient. This operation, the Nine Futurological Congress, wants to start a different dialogue to elaborate on the possibility of many, many futures instead of the single narrative of catastrophe that is on offer at the moment to think together about the future in, term, in terms of multiple temporalities with simultaneous and contradicting narratives is a way to refuse the storyline of dystopia that dominates current dialogues about what the future holds. This is not because we are optimistic or because we hope uh, to avoid the collapse of the planet, which would be good, by the way, um, but mostly because even if collapse was to be imminent and unavoidable, a dystopian lens is nothing but a trap. Dystopia is not generative, insofar as the only thing that it requires from us is passive resignation. Yes, it's shit. Yep, we are doomed. It's like res resigning ourselves to an unavoidable disaster while we keep digging our own graves and lighting the way to the end of history with the energy from burning fossil fuels, which are nothing more than the billion-year-old year corpses of our grandparents. We hope to avoid the monolithic and insufficient heroics of calamitous and dystopian scenarios by way of modest thinking. At the moment, addressing the present state of things that we want to create a future for. Individually, carefully, thoughtfully, and most important, with imagination. Not a future with a capital F, but the many futures, contradictory, complex, and interwoven. And while there are many things that we are not able to imagine yet, we can, at the very least, aspire to create the conditions for the imaginations to come. And for this, it's also important that we resist the temptation of colonizing time and determine what things are, are going to be like. We don't want to colonize the future, the past, or the present. Chances are that we are not going to get out of this planet anytime soon, at least not in the shape, form, and quantity that we currently have, because space is both hostile and expensive. So we have to do the best with what we have, and this includes creating room to play and not only the rules of the game. How can we begin to imagine imagining a world where we don't operate by way of nostalgia, where unlimited growth is not the only way to go, where all species get to play in an even field, and where not only those who have access to language get to have a voice? We want to start laying the ground for multiple futures to develop and grow beyond what we can see today. And I guess in this spirit, uh, I hope that this is one of the ways that we start thinking together. Wonderful. Uh, now I will ask you for seven minutes of battle. <laughs> uh, battle, yeah. Uh, uh, you don't have to use a for, I mean, formal, but but I, I expect reactions like one 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 on each other. Of course, we will start with Hillary because Hillary is a critical node, and there are some nodes here. So you have intersexuality and etc. So we'll start with you. But now we will. I will also ask our panelists to react on Hillary. So <laughs> you said attack. You didn't say I had to defend myself. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> punch, punch, punch. Okay. 
fine, Julieta, I see a basic problem here. There's this tension. You want to make this unique, perfect thing that can't be, you know, scaled, but only broken to pieces and made into something new, right? But <clears throat> I know from experience building my own institution that if you want the engineer, that's what the engineer wants. They want to know exactly what is the minaret on your dream, and then I'll start calculating the foundations. And I say, no, no, no. You tell me the block of marble I have, and I will respond to that, and I will make something magnificent. So I had to actually literally pour my slab, build my girders all way over spec so that I have this set of handholds available to me to go as high as I can and collapse it. Yeah? So I say that there is this, there's this desire to make this perfect thing that can't be, and that then it's gone. But this is in software. This is in the way we make things. This is these un, you know, you have to destroy it, and then you can pick out some bits and all this. And I say, what about the, the collaborative creation of a platform that, um, that any human has access to, any, you know, the, the support for all dreams? There is this desire for us to be, oh, you know, to say there is no meta narrative or there is, so many temporalities is absolute is absolute as absolute a, a conviction as to say there's only one or you know leotard you know there's no meta that's a meta narrative yeah so I'm curious about this demand that there are so many temporalities if you mean so many experiences or all this but I I just I wonder about these these tendencies in art world and in aesthetics for us to to de describe the universal platform. Whereas we are all shitting down the same tubes. We all drink, we all kiss through the water pipes in London, basically. It's this contiguous system that supports all kinds of crazy elaborations. So I say now is the time to actually embrace the universal de facto. We all have guts, we all have blood, we all need this much vitamin D. These fundamental unanimities are so much more potent than all these intersectionalities and all this. So I say that there's, there is an uh, analog for art institutions where they can say, you know what, we really hate this little bisected, bifurcated, crazy online, haptic, medieval world. We really want to open up public space and we can populate that. We can all populate that. And if we need to modify, but I just say that otherwise you, 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 you cast yourself completely aside from the material technical realities that are necessary to create platforms for all elaboration, platforms upon which we can all, as it were, elaborate our, again, specificities. In other words, anyway, that's, I, yeah, so, yeah. Done. I mean, just to, um, as there is no question posed there, it's a bit uh, hard to answer, but the, you know, what I can say is that I'm not so interested, and I, I would say I speak both for me and for my partner in crime in this case, who is not here, um, not so interested in building these large architectural things, but in circulating things through thresholds. And as I see that certain thresholds uh, become more and more narrow, to maintain them open is what is a pivotal importance for me, to inhabit these thresholds, to have foot, like, uh, feet, several feet, seven feet if you want, in several doors to keep them open. And, you know, like that's kind of uh, not so much, uh, like actually not at all about building these um, large homogeneous uh, constructs. I am actually very much um, uh, uh, suspicious of homogeneity because uh, it, it, I mean, you know, it tends to be the precursor of war, it tends to be the, the, the killer of empathy, it tends to be uh, the death of a system. So, as uh, I intend very much to remain alive, I uh, intend very much to remain heterogeneous. But we're talking about, we're not talking about homogeneity, we're talking about I unanimous it, you know, hungers I, and needs. Yeah? Um, yeah, but you know, in order to be able to address this, the unanimous hungers and needs, to, you need to be able to understand that people are more, we all have gods, but we are more than gods. And just to understand where these differences are, and I'm going to go back to the Bateson definition of what information is, um, to understand that, uh, you know, that a difference that makes a difference, that what enables it to be able to make a difference, then you know, once that has been fully laid uh, into the ground, and we are definitely not there yet, we can think about, you know, how do we make this uh, brotherhood, of, the brotherhood of all mankind, <coughs> and we can, you know, build this collective enterprise. But I think there are several steps before that. What if the threshold is literally that we are, it's literally like we need to have a water pipe system equivalent 
in online space because all, the, all these institutions need their water pipes in online space. There is an equivalent. There is a, you, there is a unanimous necessity for a platform, for a terrain to formalize a space there. And then we all go our separate ways, tear each other apart. But nonetheless, there is actually a fully spherical project to actually colonize a space of a certain quality. You see, you use yeah. certain words that I cannot handle. I mean, like, I'm not interested in colonizing anything. Uh, conquering, how about that? Is that better? Also not good. When I say colonizing, I'm having solidarity not with humans, but rather with the larger animal kingdom and life itself. That's what it does. It colonizes new niches, right? It suddenly discovers, it gets the longer beak, and that lets it eat that flower. But that's evolution. Okay, fine. But culture elaborates, not evolves to, you know, exploit niches. Right? I mean, you know, culture recombines. There are tomatoes in Europe because culture recombines. So to claim this kind of... Um, uh, pure absolutes. I mean, like, I am someone that does, you know, this is, uh, of course, there are uh, difference, but I, I can, I'm not a believer in absolutes. So I, that's, I mean, like, that's where this, uh, the, you know, like the argument, it's, it's, I mean, I, yeah, I don't even uh, feel that it needs to be explained. I mean, like, just, you see how evol evolutionary pathways follow, and, you know, like, I mean, like, only when you get to a perfect system, let's say, um, it doesn't need to evolve anymore. No? So you have organisms that have remained the same, with the same constituency uh, for the last several million years because they reach perfection. Again, we are not there yet. No, no, definitely not. But what about the idea of, you know, um, yeah, okay, anyway. Uh, homogeneity is not the idea, rather, a, co a logic for cooperation. Those things on which one must cooperate if one is to do them to the quality, you know, and what is the minimum set of unanimous conditions we can agree on and accomplish them to a high quality with our combined full spherical power of art institution sphere, you know, that, yeah. That's, that's for Baslat. That's bombastic? Yeah, that's, that's for him now. I, I talk too much. I'm bombastic, definitely. I'm <laughs> Okay. Huh? okay. <laughs> Sorry. Do I have a specific set of questions or playground? Oh, uh, but I, I, can p I can pick up on the discussion anyway. Uh, what, what, what we, it, it seems like there's like two poles, two opposing poles, like the heterogeneous and rhizomatic against the, the vertical or something like that. But uh, in my view, there's not, they're not really exclusive. And uh, the, the, the very topic we're talking or we're, we're considering now, the institution, is actually this intersection or the, the, the space where the vertical and the horizontal intersects. Because uh, institutions do generate communities. Therefore, they generate some kind of uh, horizontality. But of course, they need to have a sense of verticality, no matter how rhizomatic, no matter how ephemeral, there's always some kind of vertical in, in the institutions. So I think what we are trying to do, I think all together right now, is to maybe even balance this horizontal and vertical, right? Uh, I think also that there, is, there is another aspect, uh, and it's an aspect of uh, what somehow, I mean, we are touching this, this territory a bit, and it's the interpretational participation. You know, because somehow, you know, it's not that we share, but that only we share certain domains, but we also fight for those domains, like, let's say, freedom, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, also neo-Nazi is, is really, I mean, strong asking, with, like, has, has a strong demand for freedom, freedom of speech, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these domains are overloaded. These domains already uh, suffer with morbid infobesity, and they crack, you know? So then we call it empty signifier, you know? Uh, which actually is a, is a too playful term, you know, which was created by us, but, you know? Uh, so I, I, I think uh, I'm very unsure, like, what, what is the method? Like, what is the positive approach? Is it the consensus, you know? Is it neutralization? Is it like more aggressivity from our side, you know? I think we have to somehow, and, and this is also a matter of pedagogy, you know? like. Uh, so, in, in, in and out. And I think, yeah, I mean, I, I hope we will continue this dialogue beyond frame, and it will be even more fruity, I believe. But anyhow, now I will uh, ask Frederica, do you have any comment? Um, maybe I want to come back to um, what Muhammad uh, said that, um, about the new Center for Research. 
Um, he underlined that there's no idolization of professors or educators. And in a way, I would like to try to transform this into the art institutional uh, context. So what are we then? Are we not idolizing our position in that we kind of um, provide interpretations and um, are somewhat locked to um, invite or to actually actively invite the visitor to come up with his or her own interpretations. So um, coming back to your critique, um, as I understood it, you, you said that visitors or the audience, the society, whatever, is not ready yet for this kind of openness? Or what, what did you mean? Um, In my critique? Yes, exactly. Well, just no. I mean, I'm look. I'm dumb. I'm you know. I'm smart in a little tiny little path. So I'm just trying my best here. But I was saying that um, you know, Julia, to please be gentle after this. Uh, I think that I was more saying that if you are in undertaking to be this institution of a of a the the, the a refugee comes needing institution, they have no health care, no blah blah blah, no nothing. So you are providing psychological services. You are providing all these things, and you're providing this space where. East, Western East Theat presumably encounters refugee. Refugee is a far more amorphous category than Western East Theat, right? So, so the the question is how that interaction is um, handled. And I say very important is how the space reveals itself that it is about a certain frontier. Uh, how do you make that frontier manifest? And so I, may, you know, the, this analogy that in fact we are in a place where in fact the good shit the shit as institutions that we want access to is beyond a certain threshold and to pierce it is a cooperative endeavor. Um, once pierced, we can go back to like a, another zone where we're more comfortable, but there's this uncomfortable need for cooperation to actually pierce this vertical pellicule and claim some new territory for, where we can name that frontier, that aesthetic frontier. Because um, then you will find that aesthetic that actually needs your institution, you know, um, rather than that person who actually needs a good doctor, you know, and a job, um, you know. So, I mean, that's, that's uh, anyway, but I, I, that's being, uh, you know, now I'm like not losing any tatter of charm and stuff. I love all of it very much okay now I, uh, this is a, a right moment to uh, open Sorry. plenum to, to all of you so if there are any questions and actually i, I have to point uh your attention to this uh, very funny constellation no? uh, we are sitting and facing uh, a kid and uh you have back you have back to the kid you know uh, so actually, we are not preachers. <laughs> you are preachers now. You know, it's just I mean, it's quite nice. So, uh, any questions? <laughs> My question would be: What allow, what are the key factors that allow you, as an institution, to operate as a shape shifter? Um, I, mean, I think that's uh, I mean, like that's a desire. I hope it, it's uh, it, you know we succeed at it and. What allows us to do that, um, I think, has been like the, our the reluctance or interest in not constantly threading our own path again and again. Once we have done something, we try to build upon it or go, you know, like take it, push it further, go to the right. Um, but it's about not sitting too comfortably in in the in the space that we already inhabit. That's done. So. I mean, I don't know, I put an example, uh, the Time Bank project that I briefly mentioned. Yeah, the, I mean, it existed, it was quite, it, or it exists, it was quite successful. Then, then you're, you know, when you, you realize you have been running a project for eight years, it's like, well, okay, do I keep running it myself or do I hand it over to someone else so I can develop the next thing? Yeah. And when I develop the next thing, it's not going to, I'm not going to use the time bank as a blueprint. I'll develop, a, uh, so it's, it's about pushing my own comfort zone, you know, and just like, um, I, and it's also, it really helps that I do not consider myself an institution. So I think that's one of the uh, things that make that, that makes that possible. Um, but what you're saying is pushing yourself out of your zone of comfort and for me this is totally key 
uh, about all this new practice of being and wanting to be an agent of change because the worst thing, as you say, is repetition and comfort and being in, a, in an institution very often is that is what it represents to many of us is just the slowdown of any progress, the self-contentment of, of the the work that is being achieved in that institution. And I think, and I see that we as cohabitors of this space right now, that we all want to actually do one thing together, and that is to conquer fear. Because I think fear is the one thing that prevents us from moving forward. And how to conquer fear is you've got to take yourself out of your comfort zone. So that's, I think, the words that you just said just completely resonated with me. Thank you. Well, first of all, I thought this was an excellent panel. Thank you so much. Mohammed would have um, probably even added more glory to so much glory. Uh, no, I, th I thought that all the comments were rich, divergent, and still concur you know, concurrent, and still sort of coming together in a very concise um, analysis, in a way. But one part of the, uh, two, two things in the analysis I would like to com comment on that. And one is uh, speaking of education and um, a relationship to knowledge or to learning, eh? sort of assumes a certain paradigm of how learning and let's say this classical model of tranf transfer of learning from a professor or among sort of a, a group of people functions. And I think this is one of the questions uh, and, and one of the difficulties to realize more and more that this transfer that we have known over many, many centuries through a scholastic system that was established and so and so, the academic system that picked on, on, on this, um, let's say, hierarchical, top-down, um, how can I say, Hen handing, over, um, handing over knowledge from one generation to the other is not only interrupted, but really doesn't function very well. And I've been talking to, to people who are working in the school system, in the Austrian school system, and they say, well, actually, you know, what we're thinking about for sort of the next generation of schools is that anyway, the kids do all their learning online, right? They have the sort of uh, YouTube tutorials where they get the mathematics and whatnot, yeah? But you know what they need and what they don't have is uh, movement, yeah? Kids cannot swim, they're really having physical problems and nearly deformations. Eh? So basically what the school of the future needs to provide is, is physical movement and questioning. Eh? This, this idea of sort of uh, dialogic questioning of things that are being presented. Eh? The, the, the inquiry as a method of knowledge of digging and, 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 and so on. Eh? Uh, plus, you know, another comment from another person is like, even five years ago when applications on, on college level were made or university level in the European system, um, students were, or applicants were asked to sort of fill in paragraphs that were about, you know, 200, 300 words, yeah? Now they're down to 70, yeah? Because they just realized that it is really too difficult for most of them to um, narrate a paragraph, a concise paragraph of that length at the age of 18. So I'm just giving these examples, not because I necessarily believe in all of them, but <laughs> you know, a bit of drama. Um, so I, you know, I guess the question is, um, in which way are you, when we talk about transfer of knowledge of the institution of education and all of that, yeah, how, do you, how do you problematize that and how do you, how do you engage with it? And, Last night, um, our wonderful dinner table, um, a geologist was sitting opposite to me. His name is Mark, and he had this really wonderful presentation this morning. And he said, well, you know, what do you do? And I said, I'm a curator, blah, blah, blah. And so he said, the uh, first question to, to me was, well, how do you reach people? And like, I've been working in my field and my research for many, many years, yeah, but I feel nobody hears me. You know, so how can you be made heard and so on. So that's just to bring it back to here and now. Um, and I guess that's one of the sort of set of questions. And the, the second one that sort of relates to that, yeah, I think is this in inherent skepticism that there is vis-a-vis -vis institutions. Yeah? And I think that's sort of a second field of problems which maybe we can go and not go into, um, but I would 
probably like to hear more about the first one. Uh, I would like, of course, you to answer, but please be le very brief, like minimalism, less is more, functionalism. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, we are running off time, but... I mean, like, just, uh, you know, like, to, to answer in a very, uh, uh, as precise as possible, um, I, I, when I teach, which I do quite often, um, there is something that's very important to me, which is that it's not a one-way street. Um, if I am not learning in the classroom, then it's not working. I'm not a purveyor of truth, but it's we are, like especially now that things are being reshaped, it's a matter of building a truth together. Um, so when, if my authority is not put into question, then my classroom doesn't work. Must completely agree. I, I have uh, the same experience or the same feelings, and I can just add up the thing that uh, I, I'm always trying to some think even about the language in which we transmit the knowledge, in which we talk with the students, and I'm trying to actually e even realize that as a two-way street. It's not only my, you know, um, professional lang uh, language that is informed by my uh, skills or knowledge or experience, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a living language. It's a language uh, that actually pertains more to the students, to the young, bright, uh, interesting people, and how do they uh, inspire the, 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 not only the, the content, but the very form we are talking in, using YouTube and things like that, Prezi about secondary and tertiary education, you know? I mean, yeah. and I specifically yeah. was talking about the school because I, mm -hmm. I think what happens in secondary and tertiary education is very, very different. You know, this is where yeah. basically survival skills kick in and, and you know, people and students go on to fast track, yeah, wanting to sort of catch up and dynamize a certain form of experience, knowing that they need um, forms of approval for, let's say, success or survival with that. But I think the, the, the question really is, uh, um, you know, maybe outside of that niche that is a very particular one, yeah, which is, as I said, school education, especially mm -hmm. art, uh, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think um, in the digital, um, or in the digital context, um, you click on, we're today in the, era of Facebook and uh, Instagram, Twitter, um, you click on things, you, you, you scroll, you scan things, you don't read anything properly, you don't invest your time properly, and the, the concentration um, or the interval of concentration today reduced to four seconds. So we are not able anymore to really meditate on things, to contemplate, and um, I think the institution as such um, is responsible in a way and also um, yeah, responsible to actually generate platforms and um, several different channels and contact points where um, students or um, younger people can, um, can enter and um, find their very own kind of yeah, point of entrance into um, various topics and issues. Excuse me, just uh, just uh, to uh, react to this. Don't you think? I mean, with the multitude of entry points that you have on the um, on the uh, uh, digital in the digital space, you can you can choose whichever vantage point you want to have. It's a question. <laughs> yeah, well, but m YouTube is uh, YouTube is. I mean, it's huge. You know, I mean, I can have I can have everything on YouTube. It's like it's not. It's yes, it's on YouTube, but everything is on YouTube. Yeah, right. Yeah, the the question the is, question how long do you stay? The question is of questioning, like you sit in front of your computer and you watch a video, YouTube video and there's no proper exchange, you just... You have the chat right next to it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I prefer talking to humans. Complete right. food. <laughs> YouTube. It's no, a sign of the time and it's a reality that this is also happening. So why not transferring maybe this um, digital um, landscape or environment into the institution as well and also expand it and uh, mm. use that mm. kind of... Uh, can I just add to that, John Parmesino, like we, for instance, we've commissioned a territorial agency to do just a kind of incredibly, probably initial 
survey of the oceans and all the issues that, so that to, to be part of the, the information available at, in the ocean space um, and, to, and to, to look at many different of the issues that are facing the oceans today. And he came back to us with, he had three researchers, two of them are hackers, you know, they're going into this from many different perspectives and tapping into other institutions and so on, and they were s astonished how, la how there is a lack of, of um, you know, how you can't go to a space online and find an area which helps and guides you through that research. The, the whole study of the oceans is so compartmentalized and institutionalized and locked up into all these different frames. So we discovered that just that gesture of, of trying not to homogenize anything, but to render it easily accessible to those who really want to find out things for themselves is a project in itself. You know, it's just extraordinary. Yes, there is so much, um, that individuals can do to study things, whether they choose to do it on YouTube uh, or, or to read academic papers. I'm not here to judge, you know, everybody's gonna do it their own way and it also depends which age group they're in. But I'm astonished with my own kids, how incredibly aware they are of things today when I, you know, was into my 30s before I even started thinking about it. So there's a generational change and shift towards those who wish to make their own choices and decisions. And I think our job is really to render that easier, to help people make up their own minds and stop this top-down, forget the vertical, but the top-down, you know, teaching mechanisms that give, are uh, enforcing people to look at things in particular ways. And for instance, the whole environmental movement, how tremendously opinion and, and how it, tries to shift a whole guilt and sense of consciousness onto people, which is why it's very often resisted, this Armageddon doomsday scenarios. How does a kid of 16 relate to that? So there has to be the sense of hope and that they can discover things for themselves. And also I see a lot of young people entering into startups and just wanting to be with startups and not go and do internships in big organizations, which is the biggest thing we wanted to do when we left, or, well, I didn't actually, I didn't graduate. <laughs> but you know, this idea that so many people, there's such a pressure and I was always telling my kids, aren't you gonna do an internship? I can get you into the UN, I can get you into UNESCO, I can get you into museum and institution anywhere. They go, no, nope, we're just gonna do a startup with a friend in Bogota, Bof. You know, and that there's that s total shift into taking things into their own hands that they can manage. But there's such a lack of uh, how to navigate around all this data and information. And YouTube isn't the answer. I think it's one of the tools, but how to help that information, this is why I think Uflex is so critical and important for at least one huge generation of um, those of us who want to absorb whatever we can and learn from waffling on. Yeah, following up on what on that, um, I think that what, what troubles me in this triad of education institutions and the digital space is precisely that danger of institutions creating a, a sort of a, um, a quality standard uh, that needs to be met uh, somehow, um, which flattens out that uh, plurality or that um, the open space uh, that is potentially there for uh, there being a whole range of ways in which you can express yourself on uh, in the digital space. Um, and yeah, it's coming from Latin America, this is uh, quite evident to us, you know, yeah, the, the idea that institutions begin to create a, a, a that quality threshold and then uh, what happens if we do things that are maybe not up to par with that? Where do they go? Yeah. If I may say something, yeah, uh, along these lines, I think that I believe that they have already seen the ideal exhibition, the exhibition without the walls and where the public is the raw material. I've seen the heterogeneity, but they've seen all these things being already captured. And this is the ideal material for institutions that become laboratories in order to monitor crowds and manage uh, multitudes. So uh, 
I mean, it's, it's a great panel, but at the same time, I think we lack the scale to look at all these things in different cycles so that all these uh, terms, all these wishes uh, can be regarded as things that have been quickly incorporated in the capital economy and the museum has become the key avant-garde place to test them and they have become tools for to develop, you know, I mean, new forms of communications, new forms of socialization, and this is actually happening in museums. That's why the museum is no longer the place directed by one person or where the author is the most important thing. It's a system, it's a, it's a model for a massive cooperation where nobody can be claimed to be the author or controlling. But yet, I mean, it, it's something that is already been quickly captured in, in, in our economy. And we could mention countless cases, you know, like when all of Eliasson did the weather project, you know, and then instantly, uh, at that moment, it was Flickr and YouTube. And then when, the, so it, it actually triggered a massive uh, phenomenon where the visitors became the ones making the publicity of the museum or, uh, at the at Palais de Tokyo, where uh, Lakaton and Vassal, they conceived that space as if it were Jamal Efna, the famous square from Marrakech, being transported at the core of Paris. So all this is being somehow enacted, uh, made real and quickly quickly captured and, and appropriated. And I think that I agree very much with her. I mean, we really have to think about difference on a different uh, scale. Um, I, I, I say something quickly to that. I mean, like, of course, it's different in our case because we do not have a physical, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, space, let's say. But I mean, like what you're saying, of course, it's based to the logic of capital, you know, it's the processes of ter territorialization that are constantly happening, how things are co opted. And I think this phenomenon that you describe is what. Um, at insofar as efflux is concerned, it makes us to insist on this idea of remaining uh, in a shape-shifting space, meaning that we try to produce non-replicable models and we non-replicable insofar that we don't even replicate them ourselves. So, so that you know, like that, as you know, and it's also something uh, as to what we do with. Um, you know, in like uh, uh, profit and loss and things like that, what we do with our profits, which is to put out a theory journal that where things, I mean, like it's something about um, um, trying to, to escape as much as we can, and we don't fully escape it, but trying to escape or to, uh, as much as we can this, this logic of cooptation and of capital, and I fully agree with the, with the point that we're bringing up. What about the dark art domain and like, you know, giving all us poor quivering artists this like shock of fear that if we don't claim our art domain space and go and pay our 200 quid, we will, you know, be forever lost in the, you know, I, d I mean, that was pretty grim uh, refutation of what you just proposed. Well, the, you know, like the couple of things. One, the dot art domain is a venture of Anton, which does not uh, exonerate me of uh, everything, but it makes it so that he would be uh, much better able than me to expand on it, so I'll do a poor uh, way of uh, dealing with it. What that uh, was trying to do was actually organize, you know, it was like organizing um, uh, something as, like if you wish, a kind of like a Wikipedia and encyclopedia of artistic production from the 20th century onwards. And that has been the entire, uh, it's, it's not about uh, making uh, uh, money of poor quivering artists uh, at all, but about trying to figure out how to organize the information that we have gathered plus additional sets of information that we know exist there into one, uh, into and under one roof. Um, but Wikipedia is platform. where knowledge is gathered and given a palpable form and you it's, can, this let me just finish, yeah. let me just finish, and you can navigate it in the most glorious way. You know, that's the truly, uh, the arrangement of the knowledge on Wikipedia allows you to do a true yes. rhizomatic plunge to hardcore journals in one go. Whereas the dot art domain was trying to claim a territory with a cost associated and a, a campaign of real, like, causing me, you know, panic to get my debit card out 
and it was just so much of a homogenizing join this you need your name but that was very, i mean like this was this it was i hope that you understood that a lot of those uh, uh, advertisements your were colleague, but in, your wait no 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 wait a second wait a second <laughs> it was something that had a lot of humor embedded i really hope that you could read the humor on those ads with lenin uh, in you know lenin in a bathtub and things like that 200 um, now quid's never funny. That the <laughs> well, if you know, like the if you think that we have enough money to support our ventures uh, on our own, we don't. We actually do need to get funded, and we are not great at writing grants. Um, so this is like a, a way, if you wish, of thinking in terms of crowdfunding. Um, now the point what we're talking about navigating is that there is a certain of organization of knowledge of. Uh, uh, post-war art, where our uh, turf starts, let's say, which, is, which involves um, history, psychoanalysis, um, art production, and a lot of other disciplines that are not necessarily condensed and um, easy to navigate. Maybe they tried a little bit with that book, Art Since the 1900s, but I think it's, uh, I mean, to our, uh, let's say, understanding of it, it does not incorporate other art histories and other narratives. So part of the part of the idea of this is to be able to bring in, you know, the uh, East Art Map, like this uh, wonderful project that somebody did about uh, the genealogy of art in Eastern Europe, which is you know, which is different from uh, the, the canonical one that we have, or the genealogy of art in Latin America, which uh, is entirely different from the one that we have. So how to try to parse that knowledge, you know, that's, the, that's basically the main point of that project. Okay. Um, so I'm the last, last question. I'm quite curious about, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about organizations, but I'm very curious actually about the audience, um, because I feel that many, many platforms exist already, and even more today uh, than ever. And, uh, you know, there are very kind of specialized opinions forming within these platforms. Um, so, and, you know, it is both from political views, but also, of course, a lot of environmentalism. Uh, people are quite aware of um, climate change and whatnot, at least in a certain group or in within, you know, maybe certain groups that we also mostly speak to. So I'm wondering how do we get out of these echo chambers? How do we kind of make the borders, boundaries of them more porous, but also how do we not impose our own views? Because in the end, I mean, we're all, I guess, could define ourselves as political subjects in the sense that we want to, that we have something that we want to communicate and that we want the world to know, or we have a certain conviction that our views may be, you know, valuable for other people to know. So I like this idea of circulation, but and I also agree that at certain moments maybe we have to create a vertical, like a mushroom at least as a peak that is somehow perceptible at least. But like how how do you maintain it flexible enough, mutable enough to also change and become a shapeshifter when you notice that your own view is perhaps not valid or valuable anymore. Maybe that art history has to be rewritten. But I wonder how to create some sort of ecosystem in which views can exist and coexist, in which also very opposing and different views exist, and in which the audience is taken as, you know, is taken seriously, and in which it is not only about ourselves expressing our views and maybe getting audience numbers to um, justify expenses in an institution. views on something and then, as Frederica was saying, what are the standards, you know, the, to which you apply yourself? You mean both or just one? I mean, I mean both. I'm, yeah. I can't heat the bicycle of my son, so I just... And are you asking one of us naughty types back here that or all of us? Everybody. Okay. I mean, a museum or even this church, you have these vernacular figures, right? That is meant to allow any human to come into contact with a certain sensual audit of Christianity in its major outlines. And that was the purpose of art in the origin, right? To bring, to remember, to drag out of the ethers, to bring contact to something that was hidden in the Latin mass and to actually empower humans with this sensual audit 
the ability, as it were, as, as you were saying, we need to exercise the kids again. We literally need to exercise the sensual apparatus to, to, to understand the arrangement of meaning and form and space. And so how do you create actually a, a very high quality um, a technological, uh, spherical infrastructure that would support a real sensual audit of the artworks themselves, you know, the historical, the future, to, to accumulate ideas at the frontier, to figure the frontier. So as an institution, it's, I say, you need a figure of the archive, you need a figure of the knowledge that we can read with our bodies and navigate with our bodies, and ideally one that, that sends the student and the, 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 the sensual auditor out into reality to actually go and, and uh, behold the thing itself in place in the geography and so I say the natural shape of the archive is a world and all of these things point to the economy and the, the reality and the reality of an institution should really be a spherical planetary strata right a geo ledger we have a whole onion full of these ideally and one of them should be populated with figures of vernacular representation knowledge you know the accumulation of errors as they occur in art, in, in the multiplicity and the various frontiers, give them figures, give them a spatial arrangement, use that space, that grand, open, uncolonized, we can make as many strata as we want, but actually go spherical, go cooperative, so that the technological economics functions to provide a good quality sensual experience, not everyone uh, gaping in goggles, but actually you can have a sensual experience of a certain quality, and when I say quality, I don't mean don't let the scrap heap art blowing around, not a disallow. I don't mean quality like that. I'm the ultimate scrap heaper, right? I mean technological quality that you don't have everyone with iPhones strapped on their face, like this, you know. But actually, you maybe you need to make institutions that are literally just physical portals where you don't fuck up your proprioceptive sensibility wandering around nowhere. No, west is west. East is east, and you navigate a space with your guts, and you don't get spun and lost such that these kids who spend all their time online literally have no sense of where the sun and the moon and the reality is. Their proprioceptive balance is shot. So I say you reinvest in the body, in the physical sensual auditor that is what a human actually is, and these rich concentrations of uh, of, of public meaning that is what art somehow is in, at some level, you know, somewhere back there for a lot of people at least, sorry, what is art, I don't, you know, you know, fine. What I'm saying is bring the body to it, to the archive, the figure of the archive, make it sensuous, you know, much better than the Wikipedia rhizome, you can navigate it, but there is no figure, it's, it's only accessible to the, to the indoctrinated, it's a Latin mass still, just like biology is a Latin mass, and there is no vernacular even teaching a child oh look there is the ball of the ocean you can just see it and the sun goes under the ball you teach them that and then you adjust and say actually we go around the sun because you allow their body to actually understand things the way humans come to understand these things in the first place and 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 this sensitivity to the sensual apparatus is gone and blasted in cyberspace it is a medieval street of shop fronts you get one frame you get a frame of hate a frame of porn a frame of this all all jammed together, it's one fractal equivalency, and that is wrong. We need architecture, we need a gutter where the porn is, and we need a cathedral where the higher thoughts are, and this is what I'm saying is that do not forget the role of architecture in creating a spatial arrangement of sensual experiences, and that is what the archive and the art and all these institutions lack. They're all create according to their budget. They can accomplish you know, their own little spasm of technological quality, but I say it's actually a cooperative endeavor to claim the spherical space where you can populate it with all these forms and a, a proper sensual audit maybe happens in a museum where you walk through it, you know, in ZKM that one artist there actually said, no, you must move the bike to go left. You can't just spin and go left. You're fucking with your guts if you do that. Um, all right, yeah, I mean, but, you know, pro <laughs> problem, problem of... of uh uh, generativism huh? is that uh, and, uh, like generative terms okay. uh, is that, that they grow to un unbraceable uh, conditions so economy uh, limitation and uh, uh, safety protection haven you know like Cora you know Platonian Cora okay. uh, 
this is extremely important, <laughs> you know? Mm. It's not only about, uh, I mean, uh, like, like, let's break the wall. I mean, we need walls, huh? We need yes. walls, we need, you know, yeah. we need roofs. Definitely. Because if it rains, we don't meet, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we need a roof, basically, to, to meet. And I think this is, this is somehow, of I course, mean, very dangerous, definitely. very dangerous consideration because this can lead to, like, neoconservative things. So I think we have to balance them. Eh? So but I'm not saying, I'm saying literally, what are the principles of the architecture of this spherical layer where we can I think have I th these I, I, be I, I believe that it's time to, like, uh, you know, rediscuss what are the principles of the architecture, you know? Mm. Uh, because, I mean, not even a uh, natural primordium is, is necessary something but what we have to accept, you know? I mean, no, we I'm can... I'm saying you we, are we, a sensual we, apparatus. You have we can make, we can make nature better. You know, that's of course, I'm that's, not at all the thing. trying yeah. to revert us at yeah. all. No. Uh, David, maybe the last remark. Um, Hillary, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, Cold heartedly? Whole, or? Wholeheartedly. Oh, completely, completely, completely. Um, and it does have to do with the return to the sensual, the vernacular, the playful. These are things that are missing. And the conversation today, while well, I love it, um, the language that is spoken is as inscrutable as Latin is to most people. And so the question is, is how do we transition, create a language, calibrate what we say, um, move, and the, how do we move into the domains of these other people? We have all these assumptions about why people want to go to museums or institutions, how they behave. Um, and I think the return to re understanding that we're sensible beings, we want to be engaged, want to be playful, that is sort of at the heart of things. And um, it seems to get, often to get lost when I see institutions making plans about how do we engage this audience? And instead of going into their domains, it's this projection about what they should, how they should behave, how they should respond, what they should think. And I can tell you, having sat in on all kinds of anal um, analyses that are done by museums, it would scare the shit out of you who heard what most people say about why and how and what they do. Um, and that's the vast majority of the audiences. So I think it's really important, to your point, is to get to those, that place where we um, understand how to engage, calibrate, move into these other domains, and look from their directions. The um, other point I want to make is the online piece and about what that works. We have to remember what, this, what drives the search engines and it's money. So when we look at how to set up a strategy that enables people to navigate and judge to understand the search engines are driven by making money, advertising, and people know how to manip manipulate that as we've seen. So that's it. Okay. Many thanks to all of you. Uh, before we move uh, to have something to eat, uh, I have uh, a small poetic proposition. So. Uh, let's not fight for institution being agent of change, but let's fight for institution to be agent provocateur of change. Okay, thank you.